But uh, this, this, whole, this whole series has been on hearing God's voice and just different aspects of hearing God's voice. And specifically what we've been looking at most recently over the last, I don't know, five or six weeks is just how to be sensitive to God's voice. How to get more sensitive to God's voice. Because God is always speaking. God doesn't have a speaking problem. It's just sometimes that we aren't picking up on what he's saying. And so there are things that we can do to get more sensitive to his voice and to what he is trying to say and to what he's trying to communicate. And so that's, that's really what we've been, been talking about. And so what we're going to talk about today is being open. That there's many things that God wants to say to us and has to say to us, but often we can't hear what God is trying to say because we're not open. What do I mean by that? We get caught in routine. We've done a certain thing for so many months or years. And God is trying to get us to do something else, different. But we can't hear it. Like my friend Ashley was up there saying, God tell, wants you to give an offering. And it's like, Lord, huh? What? How many of you have ever been that way? We'll, we'll get off money for a minute. Just with anything else. God tells you to go spend some time with someone. And it really wasn't convenient. Yeah, you know, I will tell you, anytime God ever asks me to do something, he has never started with the phrase, hey, Brian, is now a good time for you? <laughs> like he cares, like he knows, what to, <laughs> if he's telling me to do it, it's a good time. And if I'm too busy doing something else, maybe I need to unbusy myself. Now, I will say this. What I'm going to teach on next week is about the consistency of God's voice. So I will say, don't go make any major life decisions off of what I'm going to say today because um, it, it, I'm going to talk about doing something new t potentially today, but I also want to talk next week about consistency because there's a consistency even when God tells you to do a new thing. Because I do know, um, you know there are a lot of what I would call granola Christians, fruits and nuts and you know, they're always doing, God told me to do this, but then God told me to do that. And it's like, dear Jesus, is he confused? God is not confused. God is, God is very consistent. But there are times where God will tell us to do something new, that God has something new for us. And we have got to begin to open up to what he is trying to say. Amen? Um, my oldest son, Paul, he's 10, 10 years old now, but when he was four... The child would eat two meals, I guess three. He would eat chicken nuggets, more chicken nuggets, and like he'd eat like spaghetti. And that was about it. Am I lying? That's about all he would eat. Would not touch a hamburger to save his life. And it was putting a cramp on us because we were just tired of eating chicken. And we wanted to get him to expand his, his horizon, so to speak, with what he would eat. And, uh, and I wanted him, I knew there was more. I knew there was more he needed to experience with his taste buds. And so I did what any good parent would do when your child won't eat what you want him to eat. I lied to him. <laughs> <laughs> so his favorite, his favorite superhero at that time was Batman. And you got to understand, my, if you know my son a little bit, he's pretty intense. And he's pretty much a one-track kind of mind kind of, kind of person. And so when he gets on something, he is on it. And I mean, for our house, from the time he was about four till he was six, he was Batman in the morning. He was Batman in the lunchtime, and he was Batman in the afternoon. Ashley and I, actually, we got so concerned. We're like, we think he thinks he's Batman. He would introduce himself as Bruce Wayne. Except for he couldn't say it right, and he would say Bruce Wang, like, like he owned a Chinese restaurant or something. I don't know what he was. <laughs> he thought he was Batman. Well, he loved watching the old Batman episodes, the uh, Adam West episodes. Uh, if you remember from like the 60s, uh, I guess late 60s, the Adam West episodes of Batman. And at the end of a lot of those episodes, they would, Batman and Robin would go eat Bat Burgers. And so I went to McDonald's one day and got a couple McDoubles, and I brought them back, and I told Paul, I said, son, these are, these are Bat Burgers. <laughs> really? <laughs> the boy put a hurting on a Bat Burger, or 
Sarah McDouble. Loves them. How is it that so often God has new things for us to go do that we think we're going to hate, but we're actually going to love? God, Paul, that is his favorite meal. Now now we're like having to like lie to him to get him out of your hamburgers. I mean, it's just, you know, I really don't lie to my child. That was that one time, but anyway. Um, but we, we have to get him to now not eat hamburgers. Why? Because he really did love them. He just didn't know. what. But why wouldn't he try it? Because he wasn't open to it. How many times have you tried to bring a subject up to, to someone? Had a great idea for, for your spouse. You had a subject. You knew there was something that you wanted to go do or whatever, but, but they wouldn't even hear you. They just turned the other way. They didn't want to hear a word that came out of your mouth. You know, it's, it's the same way with God, with us. There's many things God wants to say to us, but we're not open to it. And so he can't say it. God has a lot more to say than, than we're often hearing. Go over to Luke chapter uh, 24. We're going to start in the 28th verse. We're going to start here, look at some other scriptures, and we'll come back and finish here. This is uh, right in the middle. I'm going to break right in the middle of Jesus. Um, minister, uh, he met two disciples on the road to Emmaus right after the resurrection and after he's been resurrected. And he begins to, he, he walks up to him and they're like, you didn't hear what happened? And he's like, tell me about it. And they tell him about everything that had happened as far as the crucifixion. And then the scripture says, he expounded to him of himself from the scriptures. All right, and so verse 28, it says, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him. See, Jesus had further to go. Jesus had somewhere to be, and he would have gone further on that journey with them, but they limited him. They constrained him. He had more to say. Why was he not able to say it? Because they wouldn't go where he wanted to go. They weren't open. They had a plan. They had somewhere else they wanted to be. Now check this out. Check out the mercy of God, though. He didn't just abandon them. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening. And the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. So he just went and hung out. Hey, have it your way. But, you know, he wanted to take them further. I don't know what he wanted to have shown them, but they, they wouldn't go with him. They limited what he was able to do in their lives in that way. And, and I will put back here, and I'll show you some of the things that happened out of this in a little bit. But, you know, so often God is trying to communicate things to us, and we're not open. We, he's got new concepts, new plans, new things that he wants us to do, and we've kind of set in our routine. How many of you in here like routine? I love routine. That's my wife. I do the same thing every day. I'm so boring, it's ridiculous. But you can set a lot by me. But routine is good. I mean, it helps you be efficient, productive. You can get a lot of stuff done. It makes you dependable. So routine is not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Routine is very good, except for when you need to do something different. When the routine that you have will only get you as far as you're going. And in order to get to the next level, you've got to change. You've got to, you've got to do something different. Um, how many of you remember Blockbuster Video? If you're under a certain age in here, you're like, what's a Blockbuster? But <laughs> Blockbuster Video, like 15 years ago, it was the biggest thing going. They, they were the, you would go rent the movie on the weekend, you'd get it for a couple of nights, pop some popcorn, and you would just hang out at your house. And I mean, it was awesome. And they, I think it was 2004, they had opened up almost 10,000 stores. They were massive. But in the year 2000, there was this little company called Netflix. They were struggling, they were losing money, wasn't going well, and they offered to sell their business to Blockbuster. And Blockbuster said, nah, we're good. <laughs> We've got what we're doing. We rent the movies. 
And so Netflix, if you know at that time, what they did is they would do the, the, the rentals, but they would mail it out to you. And so you would get the movie, and then you would you know, send it back, get the next one, and so on. Well, now Blockbuster went bankrupt. They're out of business. Netflix has taken over. They did it with the, the mailing movie rentals, and then it ended up streaming things and doing things that way. Now they get the Netflix channel, which we watch going out of style. But my point is this. Blockbuster wasn't open. They said, we've got it. This is what we do. This is how we do things. This is how our business operates. And because they weren't open, they missed more. God had more. Well, I guess God had more for them. <laughs> but that's a, that's a picture for us. God often has more for us, but we get so set in our routine that we just won't try anything new. And God wants us to be open to doing some different things. Go back, if, if you're in Luke, go back to chapter 5. We're going to look in verse 37 here. Luke 5, verse 37. So this is, a, this is a story where Jesus is hanging out with the, the Pharisees like he liked to do and just kind of mess up all their religion and all their theology. And so he was sitting there, and they're, they're talking to him, and they're like, why don't your disciples ever fast? Why don't they fast? John the Baptist's disciples, they would fast all the time, and your disciples, they don't ever fast. And Jesus, basically, his response to them, there's going to be basically a time where they'll need to fast, but you don't fast when the bridegroom's here with you. I don't know if you ever stop to think about it. Why do we fast? We, we don't just fast. See, a lot of people, go, they, they have this concept of fasting. Well, I, I'm going to fast. I'm not going to eat for a while, and that will get God to move. That's not why you fast. God doesn't respond to a hunger strike. If you're fasting to get God to move, you're going to die. And you're going to end up in heaven, and he's going to say, what are you doing? That didn't go over real well. I need to explain that. God already moved in Christ Jesus. So when we fast, what we're doing is we're denying our flesh and we're getting more sensitive to the th things of the Spirit. I don't go wait and do 10, hour, 10 days of fasting in order to get God to want to heal my body. God already wants to heal my body. It's when I deny my flesh, I get more sensitive to the things of the Spirit and then I can pick up on God's voice. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so anyway, he's telling them to, uh, he, he's telling them they don't need to fast. I'm here with them. I mean, it's kind of stupid to fast when the one you're fasting to draw close to is like looking you in the eye. Just totally is messing up the, kind of the way they're thinking. And then if you get into verse 37, it says, No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. And the wineskins will be ruined. What does wine represent? It represents the Spirit of God. It represents the Holy Spirit. God wants to pour out new wine in our lives. He wants to pour out more of the Spirit of God. He wants to pour out more of the leading of the Holy Spirit. He wants to pour out more direction for us. He wants to say new things to us. But you know, He needs something for us to, to hold that in. Wine doesn't do me any good if I don't have something to, to hold it in, does it? It'll pour out all over the floor. I mean, if I have a bottle of wine and I don't have anything to hold it in, it's just going to spill all over everything. I need a new wineskin. Wineskins aren't bad. Sometimes we think, kind of get into this thought of, no, that's religious. No, you need a new wineskin. What's a wineskin? A wineskin is a custom, a habit, a pattern of thought. That's what that represents. See, we need the new wine, but we need the new wineskin to contain it with. Because if we don't get a new wine skin, and we don't begin to think differently, if we don't begin to renew our mind, if we don't begin to think like God, he could pour out all of his power, pour out all of his spirit, we won't contain very much of it. That's why so often people go to like revival meetings or uh, different things, and they get touched, and they're on fire for God for about three days. But they don't change their mind. They don't change the way they think, and then they think by Wednesday, well, God left. God didn't leave. You didn't learn to change the way you think. Your brain's like a computer. It's, the way you program, it's going to be what it puts out. 
If you'll begin to think like God, if you'll begin to change what you think, if you'll get renewed in the spirit of your mind and think like God, you'll be able to contain more of the wine of God, more of the spirit of God in your thought life, and you'll actually be able to experience more of God. Amen? But put, uh, let's see, verse 38. Where am I? I don't know. Verse 37, no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. If you want to be preserved, begin to change the way you think. Get a new container, get a new uh, framework, get a new paradigm on how you view God and some things. He's totally messing up these Pharisees' theology when he's saying this, too. You just, sometimes we can read that and we don't get it, but man, he was totally ruining what they were thinking. And then verse 39, and, and get this, and this is big, and this is important for us. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. Because I'll guarantee, I'm not going to ask, but if I asked for a show of hands of who likes change, I bet I'd get zero hands go up in here. Nobody likes change. Change is hard. Change is not fun. Change stinks. And the thing about it is, when God calls you, when he begins to give you a new idea, or he begins to speak to you, or he, you begin to get open, and he begins to tell you to do something different than what you've been doing, your first thought is, no oh, wine was better. I like that wine. I'm comfortable with that wine. And so that's, the reason I'm saying that is that's a big thing, and that's a place to encourage you. If you feel like God has been speaking to me something different, I, I feel like God told me to say this. I don't know anything, but I know he told me to say this for a reason today. I mean, I prayed about it. I could have taught him a hundred different things. And, and so there's probably some people in here, you know God's beginning to try to get you to change in some areas of your life. And there's a part of you that's like, but the old wine was so good. It, was, it tasted really good. I liked it. And I'm sure it was great. It was the best thing going for a season. Hey, the Pharisees, the law of Moses was the best thing going for a season. It was awesome for a season. But when the better has come, we need to enjoy the better. And it may take a little bit of an adjustment to get used to the better, but adjust. Because once you taste the new and you get your taste buds changed around, it's like, oh my God, how could I go back to the old anymore? Amen. My pastor, uh, Lawson Purdue, he, uh, he pastors a church in Colorado, Karis Christian Center. They just celebrated their 17th anniversary in, in Colorado Springs, uh, a couple I guess last month, and they've just moved into a brand new state-of-the-art building, holds 2,500 people. It's massive. It is the blessing of God. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but let me tell you where he started from. When he was 23, he started his first church in Kit Carson, Colorado. Graduated Bible College in Indiana, moved back home to Kit Carson, Colorado to start a church. Church of the Redeemed in a town of 300 people. Kit Carson, Colorado is not the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from Kit Carson, Colorado. There is nobody there. 300 people. Within 15 months, they had the money raised to pay cash for a building. Paid a building off. Had 100 people in his church of 300 people. Or, or a town of 300 people. Had 100 people in his church. Doing really well. Got the church building paid off. Uh, he pastored and then he had a... a, a cattle business on the side got his cattle business paid off got his car paid off got got things in a pretty good state had had three at that time little boys they're grown men now but three little boys and he's thinking basically i got my house paid off got my business paid off got my car paid off got the church paid off life's good i just got to get enough money get my kids to college and i'm, I'm home free so 
he's kind of thinking that way because he's just kind of gotten settled because, you know, playing at church, I mean, I'll tell you, it's, it's, I can speak to him from this from firsthand experience. It's hard. And, and so he's kind of got it. They've seven, eight years in. They've got the thing that's got some consistency, got some stability about themselves. Life's good. And then uh, Andrew Womack comes. He would have Andrew come in and teach at his uh, church once a year. And Andrew just gets up, and he was teaching, and he said, and he, <laughs> Lawson says, I don't know how Andrew read my mail, but Andrew said, some of you guys are saying, I got my business paid off, I got my house paid off, got my car paid off, life's good. And he said, you're selfish when you think that way. You're selfish. Why is he calling him selfish? Because their focus was all on me. I got my house, my car, my business. And he said, God has more for you. He has a lot more for you to do and experience. And so then, for the next three years, he doesn't know what he's doing, but he knows he's in transition. It's like God spoke to him out of that. He's like, I know, like, I know I'm in transition. I had no clue what we're doing. He said, I started having thoughts like if I can pastor a church of 100 and we can give away $50,000 a year to missions, why can't I pastor a church of 1,000 and give away half a million dollars a year to missions? It's like God just totally began to stretch his thoughts and, and framework of thinking. He began to expand the way that he thought to where he was thinking more like God. But he, he doesn't even know what he's going to do. He doesn't know, is he going to stay here? He doesn't know if he's going to do traveling uh, ministry work. He doesn't know if he's going to go uh, move to Denver. They looked at moving, uh, buying some property up in Denver. Could never get the thing to work out. And so he said in January, I think January 4th, 2001, I was sitting in my office and I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you need to move to the west side of Colorado Springs, plant a church, call it Karis Christian Center, and that's what you need to do. So here he is at that time, about 35, 36 years old, moves from Kit Carson, Colorado, where everything's paid off. They've got a good, stable life, three boys, uh, just life's good. Moves, starts a church with his family of five and one bachelor. With no people, no money, no nothing. Looks like he's going to die. How many of you know in that process, I'm sure the old wine tasted better for a little bit. He, he, he said, they put, we had 20 people at our first service. You know, it was just, it was, it was not good. Uh, and he said, then two of the people said, we are not coming back afterwards. So he, he said for months, he said, we would, a lot of times we'd take up $100 in the offering, and I'd put 50 of it in. And he moved, and he didn't, he wouldn't draw on a salary. I mean, he had a little bit of income coming from his cattle business, but that's it. He had nothing going. He, he, he had sold out his house, but Colorado Springs is a lot more expensive than, uh, uh, Kit Carson where he lived and so he sold off his uh, house but he had to use that to put a down payment on getting a house in the springs he had to go to six different banks to get financed couldn't find anybody that would finance him forever because they couldn't prove his income because he was pastoring didn't make a lot of money from that and then he, he was self-employed and couldn't show a lot of income and so he had a really, really hard time, could, barely could get a place to live, has nobody come and taken up $100 in the offering dear lord I don't know how they made it but he stuck with what God told him to do. He was open to doing what God called him to do when it looked like he was going to die. I'm going to tell you, what, now, if you see the church now, you're like, man, this thing's amazing. And you look at it, and you're like, man, he makes it look so easy. Yeah, it's easy now, 17 years later. And so now they just move into this brand new property. God it was so faithful. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but just faithful. They increased, increased, increased. Eventually got a building. They sold, paid that one off. And then, and then they've just sold that, moved into a... The building, that building they just moved in now is valued at $30 million. They paid $6 million for it. I mean, an amazing, amazing deal. And they almost paid off the construction loan. They've got like a couple hundred grand left on the construction loan. Had 1,300 people at their church service two weeks ago when they opened the new building. God was supernaturally faithful, and they're going to increase that much more from there. I mean, now he's on Daystar, he's on the God TV, all these different channels. And this just little note, and if you meet him, he's just so, I mean, some of y'all know him. He's so plain after the flesh, love him to pieces. Man, but it's just nothing about him after the flesh that would say, yeah, this is the guy that's going to be pastoring a mega church. But he wouldn't have got there if he wouldn't have been open. 
if he wouldn't have been open to making a change, he could have been sitting there believing in little small Kit Carson, small town Colorado uh, for more and wanting God to do more. But if he's not open to make the change, he's still going to be sitting over there wondering, what, where are my blessings? Why is it not working? Why do we still have 100 people? Why do we, yeah, I got my kids through school, but why is it? I mean, now he's got like probably half a million dollar house in the Springs. I mean, just amazing house. It just, it's just blessing of God. And I'm not, it's not all about money, but I mean, I just want to speak to you a little bit about it's important to make change when God's telling you to make a change. You've got to be open to doing things differently. Again, I'll bring a balance to some of this next week, bring some balance to the force. But <laughs> go over to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs 3, verse 5. It says here, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and he shall direct your paths. We have to acknowledge God in everything that we do. And we have to be open to change. Doesn't mean that God, everything, again, there's a balance to this. Doesn't mean you need to change. I've met people that it was like, God told me to do this, and then he told me to do that, and then he told me to do this. It's like, dude, you're a pinball. You're crazy. I mean, God's not like that. I mean, God's voice is very consistent. But when he makes the change, the, the voice will be very consistent. But there are times he will make you make a change or tell you to make a change. He won't make you do nothing. He'll let you go to hell if you want to. Break his heart, but he'll, he'll let you do it. But notice it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Doesn't say a thing about trusting in God with your head. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Does it mean we're not to use understanding? We're absolutely supposed to use understanding. We need to use understanding. When you have to make a decision, get all the information you can get. But you just don't lean on that. What do I lean on? I lean on my heart. The Spirit of God that dwells in me. The, the, the Spirit of God, the, the heart of God contains, or the heart of man contains the Spirit of God. Uh, you can look for a scripture, there's a scripture in that. Uh, 1 Peter, I think chapter 5, where the hidden man of the heart, the spirit, is what it's talking about. But the spirit of God, that's where God will bear witness and begin to show me things. And I'll just have these knowings on the inside of me, knowing that I'm called to do more. But if I don't listen to that and I lean to my own understanding, I put myself in a situation where my understanding now has to support me. So I've got a podium right here. If I begin to lean everything I have on it, is it strong enough to support me? I'm, I'm holding back still. If I lean everything on this, I'm going to fall on my face and end up in the front row. Y'all going to be praying for me. Whatever you lean on has to be strong enough to support you. We have to lean to the Spirit of God because He is going to lead us. He is going to try to lead us and guide us into all truth. He wants to lead us and guide us into all truth. And often He is going to lead us at times to make changes, but we have to be open to His voice. Go over to uh, Psalms. I'll show you this and I'll tell another story. Psalms 81. Verse 10. says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open. Open. Is he going to do it for you? No, he is not. We have to choose to open. Open your mouth wide. And I will fill it. But my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. 
So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels, to walk in their own understanding. Got the Spirit of God telling them to do something, but they're walking in their own understanding. To, to understand what it's talking about in context, because, you know, it's easy to criticize Israel until you have to live in Israel's shoes, and then it's like, wow, I don't want to beat them up too bad. You know, this is, God called them out of Egypt. Get, told them he was going to set them into a promised land. He just kind of held out of the fact that they were going to have to defeat a bunch of giants and a bunch of kings <laughs> to take a promised land. That, that, they, they found out of that when they got out of Egypt. The, the first generation that came out of Egypt, they, they didn't do that. They weren't open to that, and they, they rebelled, and so they didn't get to go into a promised land. If you read the first, I think it's about eight or nine chapters of the book of Joshua, they killed 31 kings in the process of taking a, a promised land. It was bloody. Now, there was a grace to do it. There was a grace to win the battle. There was God's ability to win the battle, but they had to come into agreement with God. They had to get open to doing something that after the flesh looked absolutely impossible. I and mean, if you read about some of the battles they won, it's crazy. You couldn't have won it except for the Spirit of God and except for the power of God. But they had to be open. And so, again, what they had to be open to was to go out and feed, defeat giants. Now, God had good things for them. I mean, the, the clusters of grapes were so big, it took two men to carry them. It was awesome. Serving God, anytime God tells you to do something, looks like you're about to die, it's because the blessing is so big, Satan's really trying to fight you hard. He's going to try to show you everything and why it won't work because he doesn't want you to get to the other side. And that's what he's trying to do, was trying to do there. So verse 12, I, I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would, would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have, now notice we were talking about open your mouth. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat. And with honey from the rock. Who's the rock? Christ Jesus. He's the rock. God wants to feed us with sweet, uh, sweet things from Jesus, but we have to open our mouths to it. We have to open our mouths to that. And I promise you, the sweet thing from Jesus is a whole lot better than the old wine. And with honey from the rock, I would have satisfied you. Now, when you stop and think about the children of Israel and them coming out of Egypt... It looked really scary to take a promised land. I mean, again, some of us, to go take your promised land may be switching your job. And you got to learn a whole new computer software. And it's like, oh my God, I can't do that. They had to go fight 10 foot tall people. Really? Come on. <laughs> it's amazing the, the things that we allow intimidate us to, to keep us from being open to the thing that God has called us to do. When, uh, when we were in Colorado, um, it, was, it was supernatural the way we, we got moved out there. I worked for, for this company in Greensboro, and then I got transferred, and it was like a mile away from the Bible college I wanted to go to, and it was, it was awesome. But my plan, because I made a lot of money at my job, and I would go to school at night, um, and, and so that was, that was a good plan. I liked that plan. I mean, I made six digits. I mean, it, life was good. That was a, that's a good plan. And then all of a sudden... After we're, we're some time in it, I begin to have this knowing. I begin to have this leading that, I, that this is not going to be, <laughs> that I'm going to need to make a transition. Do I know it after the flesh? No, I don't know it after the flesh. I can't see. Nothing I can see, taste, smell, touch, feel says I need to make a transition. Because my plan was this. Work all day. Make, make good money. Take care of my wife and kids. Go to, go to school at night get done, I'll eventually transition into a full-time ministry job that pays me, you know, good money, and, and that's how life goes. Well, God knew some things I didn't know. Because he also knew that I was going to have to eventually, to finish the program I was in, going to have to go to school during the day. I went to school from 6.30 to 9.30 at night. He knew eventually I was going to have to go uh, from 8 to noon. Now, when I found that out, my plan was from here, okay, no big deal, God. I'm in sales. In sales, if you can sell, 
they will usually let you work whatever you want. If you're in sales or if you know somebody that's in sales, that's, that's true. I've had interviews that I did being in sales where the guy said, you can be on the golf course. I don't care what you do as long as you hit your numbers. And I'm like, well, this will be easy. Because in my office, I say this. This is just, you can look the numbers up. I mean, it's true. I can have my old boss send them to you. I was double the next person in line in my division. It wasn't just I was producing. I was the top producer in their office by double. And that was a blessing of God. That was not me. I just, I want to be very clear. That wasn't me. That was God. But that, it was like, so in my mind, I'm like, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to her. I'm going to tell her, I'm going to work part-time, and uh, we'll produce, and it maybe won't be producing quite as much as what I am, but I'm already double everybody else anyway, so I'm still going to be doing real good and whatever. And she was like, yeah, I think we should be able to get that worked out. No big deal. And I'm like, well, praise God. I'll go to school from 8 to noon. 1 to 5, I go in and work. Life's good. Do some homework, and life's, life's good. And God's telling me, you, you, you need to just ask, have, I'm not hearing words. I'm just knowing, like, I need to go apply for something different. Can't, I can't get a feeling about it other than I talk to my wife about it. We, we just both have this knowing. So I applied for a job with Andrew Womack Ministries in their, their, their uh, prayer ministry department. And as we're getting closer to the next school year starting, and I, I go to talk to my boss one day. She called me into her office, and she said, Brian, I got some news for you. I said, she said, uh, I said what's that? She said, uh, we're not going to be able to keep you. I said, you're not going to be able to keep me. But see, God had already set me up. I'd already applied. I'd actually been offered the job already and was pretty close to taking it at that point anyway. And then wasn't a whole lot else to, <laughs> wasn't a whole lot of decision to make at that point when she said, they're not going to be able to keep you. But do you understand God had me set up? I never missed a paycheck. We never missed a meal. Um, we life was good. But what, how did that happen? I was open to it. If I wouldn't have been open, I wouldn't have applied. And when she told me, uh, we're not going to be able to keep you, I'd have had some hard decisions to make. I would have had to deal with stress I was never called to have to deal with. And God supernaturally took care of us. He supernaturally provided us, gave us supernatural direction all on the inside of here. I know I need to go do something else. And out of that, he was able to fill my mouth with good things. I mean, I worked in their prayer ministry department. I got so much experience. It's like ministry on steroids, praying for people all day long, having people call in from all over the place. And then we got very connected in our church. We were already connected and serving, but then we got took on a lot more responsibility and a lot more things. Um, it kind of sort of interned under my associate pastor there. And then out of that, they got to know us, and they were like, I told them, I want to plant a church. They're like, we want to help you. Wouldn't have happened had I not gotten to where God had told me to go the first time. So many times people are trying to get to a certain route or a certain dis destination, but they're trying to plot their own course. It, it's like, you may be like leaving right after here and leaving from Kernersville to go to Los Angeles, and you know, if I get on, I guess, 40 West, and it's going to take me out there, and that, that plan works great as long as there's not a major traffic accident on 40 somewhere, or as long as the road doesn't run out. The Holy Spirit knows where the road's running out. He wants to direct us. He wants to redirect us and get us so we can get to our destination. But we've got to be open. 